all, and welcome to Registrar Presentation for the Week. I'm Sean Griffiths, and today I'm presenting on acute fractures of the glenoid. Glenoid fractures come in two patterns, being the rim fractures and avulsions that are associated with dislocations, or glenoid fossa fractures that are typically associated with high energy blunt force trauma. On average, the glenoid is 32 millimetres high and 25 millimetres wide anteriorly to posteriorly. This is useful for having an understanding of the size of the fragments involved. Anterior shoulder instability episodes are relatively common with a higher incidence seen amongst our collision sport athletes such as rugby and AFL and also military personnel. Glenoid fossa fractures are less common. They're often associated with motor vehicle or motorbike accidents. Males do predominate and they, they tend to be younger while the female population tend to be older, slightly lower energy patterns. Moving on to some classification systems, as these help to demonstrate the various patterns of injury that are seen. The Bigliani classification system is one that we are likely all familiar with. It's applicable only to bony Bankart lesions. It was originally developed for anterior glenoid lesions However, there's no clear reason not to apply it to posterior lesions. It's just there are less common injury and a less common cause of instability. The classification has three grades progressing from a bony avulsion with labrum and capsule attached to a bony avulsion which has dissociated from labrum but healed back to bone, typically as a malunion. And finally, labrum has detached from bone with resorption of bone and glenoid fossa of greater or lesser amounts. Moving on to the Eiderberg classification. It's a radiographic classification system applicable to glenoid fractures with or without scapular involvement. It's a useful system as the grading will correlate to management options and potentially to outcomes. Glenoid rim fractures that would fall within the Bigliani classification would all fall within either Eiderberg 1A for anterior or 1B for posterior rim fractures. Eiderberg 2, 3 and 4 covers fractures that are through the fossa with progressively more involvement of the scapula. Eiderberg 5 uh, fractures have combinations of 2 through 4 patterns with increasing comminution. The Eiderberg 6 is a highly comminuted fracture of the glenoid. Unfortunately, this is a relatively bulky classification system, particularly for a fairly uncommon pattern of injury. There were also noted to be a number of fracture patterns not readily classifiable and reliability was lower than desired. As such, in 2013, the AO published its own system. The basics of the AO system is F0, 1 and 2, depending on whether the fracture is extra-articular, but destabilizing the fossa a single fracture line through the glenoid fossa or a comminuted fracture affecting the fossa. It does leave out assessment of the rest of the scapula that is seen with Eiderberg's system. However, the publication in 2018 showed that there was greater intra and inter observer reliability, a greater ability to classify fractures with no unclassifiable patterns. This is compared to the approximately 25% it couldn't be classified within the Eiderberg within system. The AO patterns are then further broken down. Again, you've got the anterior versus posterior rim fractures, which may occur from shoulder dislocations. So this is your AO 14, F 1.1 and 1.2. These then have even further subdivisions relating to the glenoid meridian running in the coronal plane and the glenoid equator running in the axial plane. The transverse fracture lines with increasing comminution are labelled as 14F 1.3, 2.1 and 2.2. Some of these would not be readily classifiable under Eiderberg's system. The further subdivisions of 1.1 and 1.2 that are seen here may have implications for impact on the ligamentous stabilizers of the shoulder particularly the inferior and middle glenohumeral ligaments. So, for a quick summary of glenoid fractures, 
Scapular fractures are rare and glenoid fossa involvement is a small subset of these. However, there's a high rate of associated other injuries, particularly in those with a high energy mechanism. But the most common glenoid fracture that we will all see is the low energy anterior bony bank art lesion being 75 to 85% of all glenoid fractures. So we can now move on to a bit about management. Glenoid fractures are often managed surgically. When excluding bony bank arts, approximately 80% of glenoid fossa fractures undergo operative fixation. The larger the glenoid rim fracture, the more strongly it becomes indicated for surgical intervention. However, the cutoff for operative fixation still appears to be debated in the literature. A fracture of less than 5% of the glenoid surface in a concentrically reduced joint is quoted as an indication for non-operative management. Bony bank art repairs with small fragments of less than 5% of the fossa have however been described to have higher rates of failure with non-union and resorption. Other authors note that relatively small bony fragments of 5 to 12.5% of the fossa managed conservatively still had higher rates of instability than similar patients who were managed with surgical stabilisation. A more consistently published threshold for anterior glenoid fossa injuries appears to be around 20% of the bone, where outcomes deteriorate more rapidly, and it is described as a threshold where transitioning to an open approach may also give substantially better access for fragment mobilisation and reduction. Posterior rim fractures of 10% or more of the fossa should be stabilised, particularly in patients with ongoing seizure disorders or other problems putting them at higher risk of recurrence. A four millimetre intraarticular step off is currently the most commonly quoted threshold as an indication for fixation. However, there is a wide range published going from two to 10 millimetres of step in a variety of publications. However, some of these source papers are now quite outdated coming from the 1990s. As more and more injuries can be treated arthroscopically, the threshold for intervention may decrease as the morbidity from the intervention decreases. The majority of glenoid neck fractures can be managed non-operatively, with 83% managed without an operation and 77% of those achieved a good to an excellent outcome. Indications for fixation of glenoid neck fractures include the loss of the glenopolar angle, the glenopolar angle is defined as the line from the superior pole of the glenoid to the inferior pole, and then from the superior pole to the most inferior part of the scapula. You can utilize the other shoulder for comparison of these angles, as there is minimal variation between sides. A loss of 20 degrees versus the patient's normal, or to less than 20 degrees absolute, is considered an indication for stabilization. Medialization of the glenoid to the scapula of 20 millimeters in isolation or 15 millimeters with concurrent angulation is an indication for surgery due to the impact on rotator cuff function. Translation of 10 millimeters at the neck fracture site or an interfragment angulation of 40 degrees or more are also considered surgical indications. With regards to floating shoulder, some recent publications debate whether or not it's an absolute indication for stabilization of the glenoid neck, as long as the glenopolar angle is restored or maintained. Some authors propose that if fixation of the clavicle in isolation restores the glenopolar angle, then it may be used as the primary management. Other authors state that they don't see this occurring and feel that that alternate view is due to a lack of understanding of the shoulder suspensory complex and the true nature of floating shoulders. Some data suggests that in cases of combined displaced glenoid neck and clavicle fractures, the closer the glenopolar angle approached 40 degrees at the end of treatment, the better the functional outcomes when assessed using either the constant score or DASH score. So moving on to surgical approaches to these fractures. Arthroscopic management is, of course, minimally invasive and familiar to those surgeons who do shoulder arthroscopy. However, its utility may be limited to smaller fragments. 
The open anterior approach is familiar, particularly to those who do shoulder replacement, making use of the deltopectoral interval. The posterior or Jude approach is much less common and relatively unfamiliar. However, it does give good and safe access to the glenoid neck and posterior fossa. Arthroscopic stabilization has been widely published with a variety of techniques for bony bank art or fracture stabilization described. These include suture anchor based methods with soft tissue or transosseous techniques described. Percutaneous cannulated screws can be placed with arthroscopic visualization and fracture reduction. There have also been endo button techniques described more recently, which achieve compression across the fracture site for larger fragments with minimal hardware required, as seen here. This depicts Millet's bony bank art bridge technique, where suture anchors are placed at 230, 3 and 5 o'clock points, securing the inferior and middle glenohumeral ligaments and their associated labrum with a bridging construct of an extra articular anchor, sutures over the labrum and the bony fragment, then secured onto a suture anchor placed at the fracture margin on the articular surface. This bridge provides the additional compression and stability that is required to encourage healing. This shows Driscoll's arthroscopic transosseous suture anchor technique for larger bony bank art lesions. It again makes use of a suture anchor placed at the five o'clock point in the inferior glenohumeral ligament, giving initial control. Then an anchor is passed through the fracture into the glenoid subchondral bone with suture limbs passed through drill tunnels in the bone fragment. Another anchor provides stabilization at 2.30 and then the sutures are tightened. This demonstrates one version of an arthroscopic assisted percutaneous fixation for glenoid fossa fracture with standard scope portals, a K wire being used as a joystick and a partially threaded cannulated screw used to achieve compression across the fracture line. Here we see the anterior open approach to the shoulder, which we're familiar with, with deltoid being retracted, subscapularis elevated and retracted, and a capsulotomy to access the anterior glenoid rim. This would be the open approach utilized for large anterior fossa fractures. Structures at risk, of course, include the axillary and musculocutaneous nerves and the cephalic vein. For the, post for the glenoid neck and posterior fossa fractures, the posterior approach is utilized. As noted here, it makes use of an internervous plane uh, between teres minor and infraspinatus. Once the fracture is accessed, we can revert to the AO principles for an articular surface. Anatomic reconstruction and an absolute stability. As we can see here, there are a variety of ways to do this, depending on surgeon preference and fracture pattern. To further go over the posterior approach to the glenoid, it's performed in lateral decubitus or in the beach chair position, which can also allow for transition between arthroscopic and open or arthroscopic assisted techniques. Here we demonstrate the superficial dissection with incising deltoid off the scapular spine and retracting infraspinatus through to the deep dissection with infraspinatus released and retracted, the joint capsule incised and the posterior glenoid and labrum accessed. This is utilized for fractures of the posterior glenoid and the glenoid neck. Structures at risk include the suprascapular and axillary nerves and the scapular circumflex artery. Outcomes for patients with glenoid rim fractures are generally positive. Instability is reportedly uncommon after an uncomplicated bony bank art repair with rates of between three and 10% at one to four years amongst sporting populations with the highest incidence being seen amongst rugby players with their repeated impacts. Amongst sporting and younger populations, those patients with glenoid rim fractures who undergo non-operative care have variable outcomes for instability.
The studies on this population have typically been selected due to increased age and lower demand. They often achieve acceptable levels of function and stability. However, patients may still have some ongoing sensation of instability and there is a trend towards losing a small degree of external rotation. There's not a great deal of data available for glenoid fossa fracture outcomes, but a variety of publications suggest that good outcomes with a return to near baseline function can be achieved. Anavian and Schroeder showed good outcomes with high rates of union and high rates of return to prior activities, along with functional scores similar to the general public. They did note a moderate rate of complications, most often associated with hardware malpositioning, requiring removal in up to 40% of patients in one paper. Non-operative patients who had a clear indication for surgical management with large fracture gaps, angulation or displacement do have poor outcomes. However, if they had had an acceptable alignment, which was maintained through their follow-up, good outcome can be achieved. Post-traumatic osteoarthritis is much less common than in lower limb injuries, despite the uh, larger accepted articular steps. And when patient outcomes were referred to as good, it's based on PROM scores such as Constant and Murley, Woese or DASH. So moving on to complications. Peripheral nerve injury is uncommon, but it's certainly a known risk. The majority of nerve injuries recover spontaneously, and even those requiring nerve grafts were stated as having good final outcomes. Hardware complications are a serious consideration and frequently require a return to theatre. Loss of fixation, intraarticular fixation, loosening or impingement have all been described. Bioabsorbable anchors have previously been used as well, but they appear to have fallen out of use given the newer fixation devices and anchors and the presence of other bioabsorbable material related complications. Infection and heterotopic ossification are both recognised complications of surgical intervention around the shoulder, but both are becoming less common as arthroscopic surgery is increasing. When comparing arthroscopic versus open management of glenoid rim and fossa fractures, arthroscopic management has been shown to produce similar functional outcomes with decreased complication rates, particularly in regards to infection. That same article found a trend towards arthroscopic treatment, uh, providing less anatomic reconstruction with more patients having greater than one millimetre of step. However, this was not associated with the development of osteoarthritis with a higher rate of arthritis being seen in the patients treated with an open procedure. The fracture patterns between groups were similar However, the open group did have a higher rate of proximal humerus fractures, which may have reflected more severe initial injuries. So in conclusion, the vast majority of glenoid fractures we see will be bony bank heart lesions. The published data currently suggests that these can be treated successfully with arthroscopic intervention for the larger acute injuries. While glenoid fossa and neck fractures are rare, they have relatively clear indications for operative versus non-operative management. They do appear to respond well to the treatment algorithms that are currently available. And here are some of the articles used as references for this presentation. Thank you for your time.